let us see what she is going to show us today, uh, some of the misadventures. A very good morning to one and all of you, and my very, very, very special thanks to Priya Narang for including me in this uh, prestigious course of hers. I'm not going to be showing anything dramatic, something very simple, something very day-to-day -day with which each of us are going to be connected with and which is definitely would be of uh, practical relevance to us. Now this is a very obviously a very straightforward, uh, simple case, well dilated pupil, a nice round rixis. There is that one area of suspicion. I do a good hydro because I don't think it's a polar cataract, rotate it. And then I'm not able to get that first purchase, so I decided to do a stop and chop. There's that central clear area is there. It's not for P PCR, I'm pretty sure. And then I eat up the first nucleus. The followability is good, so again no PCR. I'm rotating the nucleus. Again it's easy, but then see, there is a PCR sitting there. There's some vitreous traction, so I remove the FACO probe, inject visco to plug the vitreous from coming forward. Some of it is already there, but I feel like taking off the tiny bits of epinucleus, then do a good vitrectomy. And then the ease with which I'm able to remove the cortex is a clear indicator that the vitrectomy is good. Of course, tricot is an ideal situation. There is a horizontal uh, wraparound PCR, but there is enough PC support up and below. So with great confidence, a three-piece IOL is injected into the bag. So well, it's centered, everything's all right. And then I start removing the viscoelastic in front and behind with absolute jubilance and absolutely confident that I've dealt with this, the cornea is clear. But look, the haptic is sinking and the whole nucleus is sort of going into the vitreous and the lens and then I have to, it's all become jugglery and I have to get my piece up, somehow manage to get my haptic onto the sulcus and take a heavy, uh, uh, relaxed breath. So the learning in this case was, if you have a PCR, you should be in a position to convert it into a PCC before you place the IOL in the bag. And even if you have converted it into a PCC, it's best to inject a single piece IOL very gently and slowly unfold it because the PCC could also rip and the three piece IOLs have a forceful injection which could land you in trouble and rip the PC. Now, this was a polar cataract with riders and any polar cataract, you should operate thinking that you're working on an open capsule. So then the first thing is you create a nice round rectus because you believe that this rectus support is where the IOL is going to probably sit, so that's done. The next important question is, you don't want your bag to collapse. You do not want the hydrostatic <laughs> keep fluctuating because the posterior capsule is weak. It could give way, it could dehiss. So very gently, I create my first trench very gently, and then keep injecting viscoelastic because I don't want my back to shrink or collapse. I want the back to be distended. Until the contents are there, you're fairly safe. The bag is distended. And a very gentle phacoemulsification, keeping within the pupillary plane. And then the epinucleus has lost that endonucleus and it just gets folded up and it comes. So I've done everything by the textbook, the, but then there. You see a PCR, but this is probably a pre-existing PCR. I do not remove my FACO probe, inject viscoelastic to put the vitreous behind, and then without needing the vitrectomy, the ease with which I'm able to tease out the cortex gently is an indicator that the vitreous has not come forward. I just keep going back and injecting viscoelastic on and off to push any possible vitreous which is trying to herniate forward, but it has not herniated forward, and then I remove the entire cortex. And now what am I going to do? Inject viscoelastic in front of the rexus, fill up that space, balloon up that space between the iris and the rexus, enlarge the incision, and very gently insert the three-piece IOL, position the haptics on the sulcus, and then have the create a optic capture and remove all the viscoelastic and get out of the situation. A very simple case. The phaco emulsification is nearly done, and there the small rip of PCR you can see. I keep my phaco probe in. I don't want the AC to shallow and the vitreous to come forward. I go in through my side port and then inject viscoelastic to push back any chance of vitreous coming forward. And then slowly I would remove my phaco probe. Now what am I doing? I'm injecting a single piece IOL very gently into the bag. Believe me, even that stretching of the haptic should not be allowed. Rotation of the IOL should not be allowed. You should very gently with the IOL sitting right where it is gently tuck in the haptics into the bag. The cortex is still there. But what has happened here? Dr. Amar Agrawal is sitting right there. 
The IOL here is acting like a scaffold. It is keeping the vitreous behind, preventing it from herniating. And then with absolute comfort and ease, I remove all the uh, cortex, clear it up, and then I have a clean case. Well done. Now this is another situation, the surgery, well dilated pupil, surgery was going on quite comfortably. And then suddenly something happens, a temporary shallowing of AC, caught the PC, and then the nucleus was somewhere sub-incisionally. But the vitreous had not come forward, so I go in through the side port, and with a second instrument, somehow managed to get that piece right up into the anterior chamber, inject viscoelastic so that I push the nucleus up towards the endothelium, and now I'm going to enlarge the incision. And the plan of action is, as it was in the earlier case, now I'm going to place a three-piece IOL. Now, if the vitreous is there, you could leave the haptic of the IOL on the, sul on the iris, or if you feel there's not so much vitreous disturbance, you could position the haptic in the sulcus itself, where it is where it is to be, and now the nucleus is well protected by the IOL sitting below, and you're able to do your phaco emulsification with great ease. Yes, it's a supra capsule of phaco emulsification. You need to inject viscoelastic, then go and do a vitrectomy behind the IOL. You want to get all the vitreous, all the debris out, go in front, and again, see, there is that vitreous stand, do a good vitrectomy, inject tricord, because that's going to clearly delineate the uh, fibers, and then whatever residual is there, you cut, and you get out of that situation. Now, this is a case. The patient came to us like this, with a, a bag torn, and the single piece IOL in the bag. So what do I do? Do I just gently, res does, there is vitreous there, so do I just gently nudge it and position it there and send the patient off? or leave it like that, the patient is visually disturbed. So first, I do a good retrectomy behind the IOL, in front of the IOL, and now the responsibility is there, I need to take care of this patient, so I am going to nudge this haptic out of the bag, and as you can see, it is coming out, uh, positioning out, it out, and once I bring it out, I just enlarge the incision, because I realize that this has no place with that kind of a posterior capsular support, so I bisect it halfway, and I pull the IOL out, and then I would still, after having had done a fair amount of vitrectomy, I check whether the IOL has been removed in total, and then I go in and inject my three-piece IOL onto the sulcus, do any residual vitrectomy, and get myself out of the case. Now, this is the last video I have to show. The patient comes back the next day with a small endonucleus fragment behind the IOL. A PCR had been there, but the IOL had been placed in the bag. So then I inject tricord, go in, place a, uh, in a uh, trocar in the past planar, and do a vitrectomy from behind. By doing vitrectomy from behind, there's no gush of vitreous coming forward because you're cutting vitreous close to its home. There's less vitreous traction. There's less chance of the PC increasing in size because there is no gush of vitreous which is going to come forward. And then you have done a fair amount of clearing. You could leave the IOL there, which is well-centered and seated well, and get yourself out of the situation. Uh, what I've said is nothing di very different from what the previous speaker said, but different, different examples. This you may not realize now, but when you go back to a theater and you face a similar situation, a very simple moment, you remember what had happened, and you find that the challenge of each case learnt, teaches us to a greater learning and a better surgeon each time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra. Uh, I would just like to ask from the audience, how many of you uh, are doing uh, vitrectomies from the pars plana. If you have a rupture, I can see uh, you are a first year, so you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> so, okay. So I think um, one of the, uh, I would be really happy uh, if few people out of here would go back and try to involve doing a pars plana vitrectomy in their setup. You don't have to do much. You only have to learn how to place either a trocar or you need to make an in, uh, uh, incision at three millimeters with an MVR. You can take some tips from your posterior segment surgeons. It's not very difficult to do that. So I think that's a, uh, that would be one of the uh, great uh, outcome of this instruction course if people start going back and start doing at least a pars plana vitrectomy. You only have to venture into the pupillary zone and into the anterior chamber. Just clear off that much vitreous. If you have much more problem beyond it, that's not uh, meant for anterior segment surgeons. That patient has to be referred. But doing a very good amount of vitrectomy, I think half of the problem gets solved, you know. All the post-operative complications that usually happen like CME and everything, everything is being taken care of. 
so i think that would be uh, really fruitful if uh, people would go back and do that and never use scissors for doing vitrectomy that has to be abundant it should not be done actually and no placing of cor- um, wicks and uh, everything on the corneal incision and trying to roll that cotton and trying to cut with the scissors all this i think they sh- it should be abundant totally uh, thank you dr chitra so much for being here with us